Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. I do have to apologize. I'm super congested today. Before I started filming, I had to go and get toilet paper because in Mr. B's America, tissue is now too expensive. <laughs> so it's toilet paper for me and my nose, but at least we can laugh about that. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we are, I'm here with my beautiful friend and cohort, I guess, for this upcoming course we have starting in a few days on Sunday, where it's going to be a yoga intensive, but I have incorporated Reiki into it. And we're going to get into why I did that in a minute. But Emmy and I were just kind of chatting off camera about some like political stuff, some economic stuff that we're going to go into deeper into another video. And we were talking about how, especially in the United States, how a lot of people in the United States have a, almost like a savior complex. They're waiting for somebody else to do it for them. And that's probably the biggest lesson that we learn through any spiritual discipline is that no one can do it for you with anything in life, with anything in life, you have to do it for yourself and therefore and i'm sorry guys they're doing construction next door so if you hear banging around that's what it is it's not a demon it's an actual <laughs> construction <laughs> worker but um you know and that's that's really hard because we do come from a, the land of plenty here in the united states we do come from a place where comfort is all around us and we've almost become a people of hypochondriacs we think every little ache and pain is something that's terrible and wrong and we freak out at our own body we freak out and when things are uncomfortable we try to avoid it we try to shove it down and i will say i mean we have over 200 people in the signal group right now and every single one of those people in that group they get it don't they emmy they're facing their demons aren't they I'm actually really I, I I don't I don't engage very often, but I do, and I can't read them all, guys. I'm so sorry. I'm I'm super busy. Every time I go check the the chat, it says, you know, 114 unread messages, 200 unread messages, 88 unread messages. I'm like I, I just can't. But what I'm noticing is that you know usually when people start off on something as a group, there's a lot of people in the beginning everybody's you know excited everybody's engaging everybody's communicating and then slowly people start to, to fall away or drop off but this group is still large and everybody is still participating and everybody is still supporting each other and encouraging each other and going through the hard stuff and feeling the aches and pains and continuing to work out the next day and it is just freaking awesome yeah you guys are a huge group of warriors and this i'm so impressed and i am too and i will say we're filming this on the 15th which is the middle point of we're at the middle point of the challenge and um, i'm not sure this video will either go up the evening of the 15th or the morning of the 16th depending on how long it takes the processor to process this video so i'm just telling you guys the date in which we're filming and you know today is tuesday and so it's hanuman's day in hindu tradition i actually had that on the challenge for people to look at the story of Hanuman again I've said it multiple times from the Ramayana where Ram and Sita are married and this this ten-headed demon from Sri Lanka named Ravana comes and kidnaps Sita and takes her to Sri Lanka and it's Hanuman the warrior monkey god who has to go and find Sita to bring Sita back to, to Ram well he finds her but he can't just kidnap her and bring her back to Ram because the cycle will continue. He knows that he has to go up against Ravana. And again, Ravana is the 10 hit headed demon who can't be slain. You cut one head off, a new one emerges. And so he's in quite a conundrum. He has to figure out how is he going to de defeat this, this, this demon. And he does. I won't tell you how. You can read the Ra Ramayana if you, if you want to see how. And he can now bring Sita safely back to Ram. Well, the whole story is just a freaking metaphor, guys. It's a metaphor. Ram is God. Sita is your soul. Ravana is your ego. And Hanuman is your courage. It takes courage to be able to go up the, the ten-headed demon who can't be slain. Your ego, your false sense of self. And what is courage? Courage is being deathly afraid and doing it anyway, doing it while you're afraid, continuing to move through the crap while you're scared as shit and shaking and you're about ready to vomit and yep. you do it anyway. 
You do it anyway. And I promise you guys, oh my gosh, if you can do this with any big or small, with anything, if you can do this, you will come out the other side so incredibly empowered. It is life changing. Yes. It's life changing. Yeah. Start to see everything because the the point of the ego, guys, the point of the false sense of self is to provide you with that friction. Right. So if we had no Ravana to steal the soul away from, from God, then we would never need a Hanuman. And through that friction and that courage, the soul can know itself. And so even, even though I was laughing with Stephanie, our friend Stephanie, I was like, you know, the underworld, we go into the underworld multiple times and then we resurrect again. That's all the resurrection stories. That's all they are, guys, is metaphors of having to go into hell and then come back up again. But it's not just going to be one time. You're going to be going down multiple times through every every little thing you have to bust through. And I was laughing with Stephanie. I was like, you just got to go ahead and buy some lakeside property and get real comfortable there because it's going to keep coming up. But the more it comes up, the more you realize that your false sense of self is false. Everybody else's false sense of self is false. And the world itself is just a hologram for us to know ourselves. And so things, Mm -hmm. that fear that you once felt starts to diminish more and more and more and more because you realize as stephanie says you can't kill a soul you realize that your soul set this all in motion for your highest good and that's powerful Mm -hmm. uh tomorrow we have you guys looking back at the kuan yin um activation from the sophia code because you're going to be getting into getting into childhood trauma and looking at from an outsider looking looking as the watcher what kind of childhood traumas you went through that maybe shaped you as an adult. And part of your exercise tomorrow is you have to last a few days ago, you wrote a letter to someone in your life that you admired. Well, tomorrow you're going to have to write a letter to your childhood self. You're going to have to tell that little boy or that little girl, how much you love them, how much they're needed in the world. Uh, Let them know that what happens to them is not their fault they're innocent and that they are still that little boy and that little girl is always going to is always a part of that fractal of God. And so I'm having you guys write that letter as a, as someone as writing it to yourself, even addressing it as maybe you had a nickname as a kid, write your nickname, dear, dear, you know, Bubby or whatever your nickname was as a kid and, and write that letter. And then I, I give you the option. You can either write it in your journal so you can reread it or you can mail it to yourself. Actually take the time to address it to yourself and mail it to yourself, to start to work through all of these obstacles, this friction, you know? And we, we think we kid ourselves, right? We think like, because the false sense of self is the false, it's the biggest joke of all, right? So we have these things happen to us in life and we push it down and we think we can just ignore it and no one's ever gonna know. Well, people might not know what actually happened to you, but you can't ignore it because that energy is still there and it's going to come out in other ways. It's going to project. It needs to come out. So it's going to come out in other ways, whether that's through hurting other people or I'm big and I, I usually do self-sabotage, having anxiety, having getting caught in the samskaric loop of, of reliving the, these obstacles until we, we decide to say, you know what? This isn't an obstacle. It's a puzzle. And I'm the puzzle master. And I'm going to finally go back and unpack this and take a look at it. And it's going to be painful and it's going to suck. But the more I settle into it, the more I lean into it, the less power. Have you noticed that too in your life, Emmy? And for people watching, like when something really bad happens to you and you try not to talk about it, but then you start talking about it, like whether it's in therapy or you open up to a friend and the more you talk about it, all of a sudden, the less power it has over you. Have you guys noticed that? It's like you're releasing it. Yes, because until until you consciously and intentionally process it, it will sit in your body. Yeah. And when it sits in your body, it just festers and grows and enhances and gets bigger and until it's not you gonna go away until you yeah. you kick it out. Until you evict it. You know, and that's, but that, but in that, in that sense, like I've said many times before, when we start to take our power back too, we realize that all these things that happen to us, these wounds that we carry, these are actually very sacred things. And when we, we flip our perspective and we say, oh, if you had an abusive parent or something, 
okay, there's a very sacred lesson in that that I agree to as a soul. And I know that's really hard for people to accept when really bad things happen. I mean, I've both been through some really horrible stuff when it comes to being a girl and RAPE, all that kind of stuff. But when we start to like accept that there's a lesson there that we agree to as a soul, we take our power back. We start to take that power back and we start to release um, whatever held emotion we're still hit. Cause it's, it's never, and I love that Shanti, our friend Shanti says this, that it's not, you know, so many people are so kind of get obsessed with wanting to know the story. Cause a lot of times we have these emotions and we don't know where they're coming from. We don't know what happened. We want the story. But as Shanti says, the story is just the drama. It's just the action that caused the reaction. What we're working with is the reaction. And as my trauma therapist told me, sometimes we don't need to know the story. Sometimes there's a reason why you can't remember the story and you need to respect that. And we just work with the reaction. We work with the energy of the reaction, you know, and, um, and it's the same thing with past life stuff. You yeah. know, when, when past life stuff comes up, it's, it's being brought to your attention because that's something that needs to be healed, not something that needs to be investigated and distra and distract you from this life. Yeah. It's coming up because it's an area that you, that has been carried over from a past life or past lives being brought to your attention right now to address right now to heal. You know, I, I, it's very, very easy to get sucked in and distracted by trying to figure out all of your past lives and who was I, and that doesn't matter if stuff, if stuff has come being brought up, heal it and move on. You know, your, your duty is to this life. Yes. Thank you for yeah. saying that too. And I, I think a lot of people, I think Stephanie said it best when she said, you know, when you grew up in a super Christian home or a religion where reincarnation isn't accepted and then all of a sudden you realize that it's a real thing, you do become very interested in it. But but yes, you're right. And I've said this before. It's interesting, but, but see it as something, oh, that's interesting. But what you're carrying over, the baggage you're carrying over is the lesson as an orb is going by, um, not the actual life. You're not in that life anymore. You're in this life. And sometimes I think people cling to past lives because they're using that as an escapism for something going on in this life now. And the last thing, my friend Cindy always says that. She's like, listen, I'm just trying not to build any more karma for my next life. Like, I'm just trying to like make sure that I don't act accidentally load up, load up more baggage. <laughs> you got to get the whole Louis Vuitton set to take into the next life. Like, I'm trying to unload some stuff in this life, not carry more into the next. And so if you're using that past life as escapism, catch yourself. Catch yourself. What are you trying to avoid as you are now? Because right now is all we have. The past is done and tomorrow never comes. All we have is now. And so do you want to travel to the next life with the full Louis Vuitton set? Or do you <laughs> want to travel to the next life with just like a little backpack? Right? So, um, yeah. So thank you for bringing that up, Emmy. And the thing is, too, guys, you know, all these avatars we live in, we look at the false sense of self, which is what, yes, the body is the Shakti of the soul. Yes, it absolutely is the expression of the soul. But it's not the soul. So the body, the soul can live without the body, but the body cannot live without the soul. So what does that tell you? And this is where, and we'll get into this in the yoga course. This is where we have the biggest conundrum as human beings. We have this idea. This is what Patanjali is telling us. I know emmy has been studying the sutras on her own, and it's pretty fantastic fabulous isn't it like patanjali was like a scientist and every time you read the yoga i mean i read the first 16 years now i've read the yoga sutras once a year and now i've been reading them even more since we're going to be going deeper into them in the course and every time i personally reread the yoga sutras i see something else i didn't see the, first, the, the last time more and more is revealed and he's literally taking notes on human suffering that is literally all the Yoga Sutras is telling you. You got the three stars of the Yoga Sutra. You have Purusha, Prakriti, and Ishvara. Purusha is, it's your soul. We would call it the soul in the West, but it's deeper than that. It's like the Atman, the Brahman, the, the part of you that has just all, always been. And then you have Prakriti. Well, Prakriti is nature. So it's the Shakti. The Purusha, the soul, is the Shiva. The body, nature, is the Shakti. Prakriti, it has, there's two rules to Prakriti. It has a birth, a life, and a death. It runs on a cycle. And because of that, because of that first rule, it's always in a state of changing because it will die. So it's always in a state of changing. 
Purusha, on the other hand, is never changing because it's eternal. Now, the third star is Ishvada. What is Ishvada? Ishvada is basically God. It's the Lord. It's the highest state of God. All right. And so Pat Patanjali is telling us that what belongs to Ishvada is Purusha. But we as humans come down and we mistaken our we have mistaken who we are this is where human suffering comes from we think who we are is prakriti when who we actually are is parusha and part of this whole systematic breakdown through yoga is to show you that your body is not what you are eternally it's just an expression of the now and so we we quite literally in the ashtanga practice break your body down and this, the practice is designed from for thousands of years ago. This practice is designed to piss you off, to trigger you, to make you sweat, to make you want to cry. As David Garik, one of my original teachers, asked Guruji once, Guruji, is this pain necessary in the practice? And Guruji said, yes, because pain is real. You can kid yourself all you want with your ego, your false sense of self through the mind. The mind stuff, the chittam, as Patanjali says. But when that pain comes up, you can't kid yourself anymore. There's a vulnerability. There's an honesty there. And through that breakdown of the purusha, we start to see where we're attached to the purusha. Let's just take something very, very simple. Not very, very uh, vapid, let's say. We know we're coming up on January. We know that a lot of people, we, again, as Americans, we live in the land of plenty. We got a lot of people who are overweight. So every January, what do people do? They make a New Year's resolution to lose a bunch of weight, to go to the gym. And maybe for the first couple of weeks, they're on that resolution. They're burning the calories. And then they get off of that. They gain their weight back. And so they get depressed again. So they're on this yo-yo of the body. Because what's the body going to do? It's always going to change. So if you... If you exercise, it's gonna it's it's following the rules of nature. But when we put our attachment to that, we start to then go into suffering. If that makes sense. Now, with that being said, I actually recorded like yesterday for next week. I recorded the next Hathor reading, and the Hathors tell you that you absolutely have to have physical exercise. The body does have to be at a high heightened state of athleticism in order to evolve spiritually. Why? Because the more that the consciousness awakes, the more the soul awakes, the higher the vibration is going to come in the body. And if the body is weak, if the body is out of shape, it's not going to be able to hold that vibration. Does that make sense? It made yes. sense. Like, yes. Like this is what we're got, what we have going on is a beautiful marrying of, of physical and spirit. Mm -hmm. If our physical body is so toxic and so uninhabitable, our soul isn't going to be able to descend all the way. And, and we can't ascend until we completely embody. Yeah. And yeah. You, have, you have to make your temple a healthy environment for who you are. You know, most of us are hanging out up here. Yeah. Like we just, our bodies are so sick that we couldn't even come down in, into them if we wanted to. Oh, absolutely. And that is something I keep telling people. Like if you, because I've been studying over the past couple of years now, obviously the missing gospels, I've been studying into the priest and priesthood of Isis. You guys, all of these ancient faiths all involve physical exercise. All of them. Yoga is one of the oldest in the world. The priest and priesthood of Isis, those, those people were exercising. And I keep telling you, they weren't trying to look good in a bathing suit. It wasn't like they were getting a six pack to be on the, on the cover of like what playboy or something like that wasn't their goal. They understood that the body being the Shakti of the soul was how the soul was going to know itself. And so if we understand that we're putting, so if we, if we think, if I think that who I am eternally is Bryce, then my, then I am wrong because I'm only Bryce right now in this moment. This avatar is the expression of my soul. If I think who I was in a past life is who I am eternally, then I'm wrong. It's all just expressions my soul has given me in order for my soul to find itself. Now, with that being said, within that expression, for the soul to actually know itself in this moment, I have to be Bryce. I have to go into Bryce. I have to drop into my body because the body is carrying the chakra system, the Bunda system, all the different fluids, the different nadis. And so I can't, and that's another mistake, and the Hathors talk about this, and the Yoga Sutras talk about this as well. That's another mistake people make in spirituality. 
where they completely separate themselves from the body. They let their body get fat. They let their body because that's they want to because the soul is separate, but the soul isn't separate now. The body is that expression. I hope that's making sense. It's such a and and, and it's so it's so funny because Guruji used to say ninety nine percent practice, one percent theory. Let me tell you guys a little funny story. Before the Americans started coming over to India to study with Guruji, before the white people came. He would say, apparently, the story goes, he would say 70% practice, 30% theory. But then these hippy-dippy boys from America came over in the 60s and 70s. All they wanted to do was smoke pot, drink coffee, and talk philosophy with Patabi Joyce. And Patabi Joyce was like, absolutely incorrect. You need to practice this because what happens, and Emmy's been experiencing this through the Ashtanga practice, is the theory, in theory, it's very simple in theory. In theory, in that abstract thought of what we're saying, it makes sense. But once you step on that yoga mat and you got to live through it, that's when it gets hard. That's when you start to see it playing out in your own life and you're like, oh, fuck. This <laughs> is hard. My hip hurts like hell and I can't. You know, and that's, that's, it. and he talks about the sutra where it talks about the mind wants to gravitate more towards pleasure and pain. Even if that pleasure is going to bring it to ultimate pain, how many people will have a hip pain? And so, I mean, I'll tell you a story. We had a student at AYA not long ago that would practice for a couple of months and then he would be out for a week with back pain. His back hurt. So he went come for a week. Then he'd come back, practice for a few months, and then he'd be out for a week with back pain again. It was this cycle. And finally, Todd said, listen, this shit's not going to end until you just push through that back pain. You got to, your bot, your practice is showing you something. And instead of actually leaning in and biting into that pain and continuing the practice, you're backing away. Mm -hmm. It was the same with me. I know I've, 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 I think I've told this story before when I was heavy into first learning second series In second series, you're doing a lot of really deep back bends and then you're putting your leg behind your, your head. So you're really moving your body. You're flexing your body backwards and forwards very rapidly, right? It's, 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 it's why it takes about 10 years to prep for it because it's a lot, it's very demanding on the physically on the body. And I, I, I didn't know at that point, I had no idea that ribs could actually pop out, like dislocate. I didn't know that, 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 that they could do that. I've had and, that happen. Yeah. Oh, it's so painful. The first time it happened, I got up at like three o'clock in the morning. I had a hard time breathing. So I, of course, got on WebMD and diagnosed myself with either a broken rib or cancer. <laughs> so, <laughs> either, but, but then I found out they had been dislocated. And so I had, it, I had like seven ribs that needed to be popped back in. Well, it's kept, it kept happening. So I would go to Mysore in the morning. I'd do all the leg behind the head stuff, deep back bend, and I'd walk out, and I would feel my rib was out. So I'd go to the chiropractor, get it popped back in again. Same repetitive cycle. And it was just not shifting. And it was actually Tim Feldman, the teacher I smacked that one time, who said to me, what would happen if you just stopped going to the chiropractor? What would happen if you just let your ribs be out for a moment? He's like, what's happening is your body is trying to recalibrate itself. You're opening up all these new new passageways in your body with second series. And so the ribs are going to pop out a little bit while the body re realigns itself. And you keep going back to the chiropractor and they pop them back in. And so you've totally undone. Every time you go to the chiropractor after practice, you've totally undone everything you did in the practice. And so every day you're having to start again. And he was like, what would happen if you just dealt with the pain for a few days? And I did. I stopped going to the chiropractor. I just dealt with it. I got through that phase. I had a breakthrough. And I haven't popped my ribs out since. Yeah, the muscle, the muscles needed to be developed around those areas to, to hold them in. And and I'm a big fan of chiropractic. But oh, I'm, a fan, I'm a fan of chiropractic along with muscle work. Yes. Because if you're just going to continue to get adjusted without doing the muscle work and strengthening the muscles to hold you in place, you're just going to keep having to get adjusted. It's going to be a, a constant cycle. Yeah. And how many people in your life, like I know, Emmy, we all, 
So everybody always has something that they're struggling with continually. So if like you have knee issues, you're probably going to have knee issues for the rest of your life because that is something that you're learning in this life. What do knees represent? Knees usually represent fear of the future. They're connected to your kidneys. And a lot of primary series, the binds are going around the kidneys. Um, John, you should see where you're twisting your ankle and folding in on it. That that uh, that part of the foot that's being pushed on the floor is the, the pressure point to the kidneys. And so a lot of times people's knee, knee issues will start to pop up again at primary series and it's because you're literally exercising and detoxing an obstacle that's been there that started in thought everything started in thought and so with that being said of course we're not going to be stupid i'm not going to take your leg and throw it behind your head without it being prepped for it we're going to have to lean into it i was telling emmy i know many people who wear knee braces while they practice in ashtanga yoga but they still come in every day you know sometimes the issues are coming from the hip the hip is the biggest joint you have in your body, and it does not matter how flexible your hip is. It's always a shit show. Doesn't matter who you are, your hip. It's like that that storage unit where we take all of that the mothballs and the leftover stuff of grandma when she died, and we take all that stuff and we put it in that storage unit. So your hip, all these things you've gone through. From this life, past life stuff you don't remember that are uncomfortable, that you don't know what to do with, you've subconsciously taken that and put it in your hip. And so when we start to move, and you can tell because the hip, the femur bone and the hip socket, that femur bone should be able to move pretty smoothly, right? It's round. It doesn't go back and forward only. It can go other directions. But we get so jam-packed with stuff we don't want to deal with that it gets stuck. It gets tight. And so we're trying, starting to unstick that. And we start to unstick that, it's going to be uncomfortable. My left hip is my problem, child. My left hip is just, I, I noises come out of my left hip that I swear are not humanly noises sometimes. Like, it, there's shit there, right? But because I'm able to change my perspective, I find my left hip super fascinating. It's way more interesting. My, my right hip's pretty boring. Like my right hip, my right leg goes very easily behind my leg, no problem. But when I pull that left leg behind my 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 head and I feel an interesting sensation and I, this weird sound comes out of it, that's entertaining. That's interesting. What is that? What's And so I'm hoping, and I see people in the group chat saying that. I'm just seeing this as interesting. Yes, it's interesting. It's super, super, super interesting. My left hip being out means that my right shoulder slumps. I don't know if I, I kind of do this. It's connected to the left hip. It's not necessarily the right shoulder that's the issue. It's coming from the hip. And so when we start to see our bodies in this way, yes, it can be overwhelming sometimes, but it's also really fun. And we start to realize how special and how intricate and details and detail these organ isms we're living in, actually the information they actually carry that our soul created to express itself. I hope, does that make sense? Am I making sense? I feel like I've done this for so long that I know people are like, this girl's mm -hmm. magic crazy. What is she talking about? <laughs> and you know, it when when you work through this stuff, I don't know about anybody else, but for me, I have an idea in my head of how I think things are going to come out. And then there's how they actually come out. And, you know, I'll go through life and I was, I was very insecure um, I was always following the rules. I was always submissive just to authority. Um, and what I'm noticing is when you work through this stuff and like, I've had a lot of issues with my shoulders, um, shoulders are, are, have parental stuff in it. It has authority stuff in it, you know, and I'm working through my shoulders <clears throat> and I'm getting more strength and I'm gaining flexibility and as these issues are being worked out and I'm dealing with the pain, what I'm noticing is my fear of authority and my fear of like studying certain things like law is dissipating and I'm diving into it. And it, you just don't notice because it, the change is so subtle that you just don't realize and notice that that's what's happening. Over the last two months, you know, I've really been strengthening and flex, uh, strengthening and increasing flexibility in my shoulders with with my practice, and correlating that with 
the things that have happened and unfolded over the last month have shown me that these issues that were in my shoulders, creating this fear of authority are being worked out and that fear is dissipating and I'm taking action. And it is just like, yes, you so know, let's, let's say that you had spent your whole life in me just ho hum. I have shoulder issues. That's just how it is. And you never dug into your shoulder issues. Do you think you would be where you are now studying the law and studying? No. no. I wanted to point that out because everybody who's like, oh, I've got this, I've got that, I've got this problem or that problem. Well, if you live that way, you're closing so many doors to your whole human potential. And yes, it's going to hurt. I'm not saying that by diving into Emmy's shoulders. I'm sure she's she's going through a lot of pain opening up that stuck energy. It's stuck energy for a reason. I've gone through a lot of pain in my practice. I broke my effing sacrum in a practice. Like we go through these, but but that's part of the process. We cannot be afraid of of feeling pain. We I know I know in our society there's always a pill for that, right? So we don't have to feel things. How many pills are being uh, shuffled out to humanity so we just don't feel things? Mm -hmm. We're supposed to feel. That's why we have an effing nervous system. That's right. why God gave us a nervous system. Pain is an excellent teacher pain is an excellent teacher it's necessary suffering is what's not necessary suffering is created by an attachment to the pain via our ego and then we attach to the pain and we judge it and we feel sorry for ourselves and we sit on a pity pot and that's suffering suffering's unnecessary pain is necessary you can't grow without it growing pains you know i mean there it's even you know embedded in our our vocabulary yeah and that's why i say too like to me watching a clean yoga practice is boring right because when i see somebody who has a pretty clean primary series if not they have it's not that they've completed the work of primary series emotionally but they've worked through a lot and so it's released itself and it's clean when the second series gets sloppy though after the that's when it's interesting again because we now we have new opportunity Right. So I always tell my students in live classes, ugly yoga is my favorite yoga because ugly yoga is opportunity. Ugly yoga is the real story. Ugly yoga is the reality show. Ugly yoga is the treasure chest. It's like that 10 of pentacles in the tarot card deck where that heavy, heavy chest that's ugly, you open it and then there's all these jewels inside. Right. And we are so programmed to think that everything has to be perfect at all times we didn't come here to be perfect we came here to be messy because that's where we freaking learn is through the mess and um and so i want to talk about so when we're working through the body this is why i'm going to tell you guys i know i said in the beginning so if i didn't say in the beginning we have one seat left for the yoga intensive that's starting this sunday um, a lot of the people doing the yoga uh, intensive are also doing the 30 day challenge too. So I'm like, you guys are mega warriors because that's, you're going to have even more. I'm telling you, I just finished up your homework for the first week doing the syllabus for your homework. You're going to have a lot more journaling to do. But, um, but uh, when we're, when we're talking about this energy, this energetic body, now I, this is the first time I've ever taught a yoga course on a zoom. Normally in before the whole timeline change of whatever the hell it is we're going through right now, I would teach you one on one, or I could touch your body, I could adjust you, I could work with you with your actual energy. But because I'm on a Zoom, I can't adjust you. I have to rely on just my my words um, and your work that you put in yourself to meet you halfway through the Zoom. And so as I was contemplating creating this yoga intensive, it was like God was like. Text Emmy, bring Reiki into it. I've never taught a yoga course where I brought Yake, Reiki, Yake, yoga, and <laughs> I love it. Yake. <laughs> There's the celebrity. That's what our course will be called, Emmy, from now on, Yake, because <laughs> it's both yoga and Reiki. But I, I have taken my level one and my level two, uh, two minutes in Reiki. I did it a long time ago. I never, I always knew that I was never going to be a Reiki practitioner, but I did it for my own education. I was heavily at that point, obviously heavily involved in yoga. And so I personally was like, I need to learn more 
about the energy in my own body that's not necessarily my body's energy of that that the energy that directs the body the, the the subtle energy behind the blood flow that's that's directing it and so i did level one and level two just so i could understand it so i was sitting there and it was like god was like or my guys were like text emmy because by bringing the reiki into it i feel like the intention is that the students taking this course are going to have the yoga information, but then also have, you get two sessions with Emmy privately where she does a, a course on you. And I think she's going to send some information over for you guys to start to look at your own, feeling that own energy. I know a lot of times in, yo in yoga, we actually practice feeling the energy and when we chant, I don't know if I've ever said this on a show before, but a lot of people mistake the mudra of chanting by smashing their hands together to chant. This is not the chanting mudra. This is the greeting mudra. mudra. The chanting mudra is this. Why, mm -hmm. Emmy, why are we doing our hands like this when we chant? Since you're the Reiki master, why are we doing that? Why did the sages thousands of years ago create this mudra specifically for chanting? Well, when you when you put the palms together, you have chakras in your the palms of your hand. When you put your palms together and there's space there, you can ignite the energy and you can feel it. If everybody just takes just take a second right now, just take a second, close your eyes, put your hands together, make sure that there, there's a little space there and just focus on the space between your palms and just think just think energy. And sometimes it can take a few seconds, sometimes maybe a little longer. Most of the time it's immediate. You can feel this heat. That is your key. That's your energy. That's your life force. That is part of who you really are. You know, this body, like Bryce was saying, is just an avatar. Who you really are is the energy that holds all this body together. Yeah. And that's what, that's why, and, and I actually was so, when we do, and we'll talk more about Vedic chanting in the course, because we know Sanskrit is a light language. So there's healing tones in the Sanskrit. And so we do an opening chant in Ashtanga Yoga. So your, your head's bowed, you've got your hands cupped like this. You're chanting basically into your hands, activating that energy flow before you then start your practice. How powerful is that? How powerful is that? Mm -hmm. And so, depending on, depending on like, okay, I think everybody should get attuned to Reiki, whether you're going to practice it on others or not. I think everybody should get attuned, honestly. And there are different lineages. Yeah. There are, are lots of different lineages. The lineages of classes that I have taken have um, an evolved form of Reiki energy called holy fire. And I'll, I'll activate holy fire at the beginning of my practice when I do the yoga chant. And it is amazing the flow that comes like it is i really had to let go of perfection and like what bryce says a clean practice because i just wanted to copy what other people are doing and i wanted it to look just the same you know because what it looks like is what it's about right no <laughs> not at all <laughs> so no. my, my practice is is not clean at all and um i but I activate the energy and, and it tells me things through intuition, through um, different pains and sensations and feelings in my body. You know, it's not all pain. It's not all pain. Pain is there, you know, some of the time, but there are sensations. And when, when you can connect with your body, especially in this meditative flow state, like you get in with yoga, when you can connect with your body like that, it strengthens your intuition. It strengthens your discernment. It strengthens your ability to, um, to listen to subtleties because subtlety and, and being able to tune into that subtlety is where you're going to be empowered. It's, it's your, that's your power. You know, when you can hear that still small voice and listen to it and drown everything else out and be in this flow state and really connect with your body it just it, it's it's so beautiful and so amazing having a spiritual practice through the physical like this is the first time that i've um attempted spirituality through a physical practice 
And there's many, many different ways, many different ways to walk down spiritual paths. And, you know, yoga is one of them. And I, I tell you what, there you can there are there is so much to learn from each path. Um, whatever you feel like you're being guided to, whether it's yoga or Reiki or another spiritual path, follow that. Investigate. You know, your higher self, God, source, universe, whatever you choose to call higher power, is guiding you there for a reason. You're you're being guided. If you're not going to listen to those subtleties. And you're going to miss out on a lot of awesome stuff. You'll just have more luggage to carry to the next life. <laughs> yeah. It's so interesting you're saying that because book three of the Yoga Sutras is the portion on accomplishments. And I debated because traditionally when we teach yoga, we teach the sutras, we only for the first like 10, 15 years, we only focus on the first and second sutra. And that is so that students, when they come into the third, the third suit, the third pada, the third book, um, they, they are humble. Because it, it is the book on the Siddhis, as we call them. Siddhis are like yoga powers. What do I mean by that? It means the the high the heightened intuition. Um, eventually things like levitation. When you learn to have when you learn to really live in that um, energetic power, your body's not as heavy anymore. And so you have these abilities. Um, there's it's documented in India. You know, when uh, people started to or white people started to explore the Himalayas, they would run across yogis in like loincloths sleeping in snow and they were fine because they learned how to control their own sense so their senses are controlling them they were controlling their senses and i actually decided i decided that in this course we are going to go through the third and fourth uh pada um because we're going to be breaking some rules because this is a time of great friction in our lives and if you are humble enough to take the teachings of the first and second pada then hopefully your mind will be ready to take the teachings of the third and fourth pada because all of these siddhis, these abilities are not going to come clearly to you unless you're able to descend into the messiness of the false sense of self first. And once you, I always say, and I'll say it again, this is said all across the Ashtanga world. The easiest students to teach are the beginner students and the advanced students because both the beginner student and the advanced student know that they know nothing. So I want you guys to think about that. The advanced student also knows that they know nothing. It's the intermediate student that thinks they know everything. That is hard to teach. Right? So think about that if you're a beginner and you're intimidated by the idea of being a beginner. You're, your body might not be in the same place as the advanced student, but your mind is. And that advanced student doesn't care that you're... Because they've been through hell and back with their practice. They're... Todd tells a lot of funny stories from India with Patabi Joyce. And there was this one student he used to practice beside the Mysore room. And she was like in fifth series, which I'm telling you guys, I don't want to go past fourth series because it just, I have a hard time watching people practice fourth series. You only really see it in India because it's like the way the, the contortions they do with their body, like they bend their body in places the body's not supposed to bend. So it's it's really hard. Like third series is beautiful. It's more advanced than most yogas are anyway. So I'm cool with that. But this one student was like a fifth series. And Don said that Guruji would come and put her in the posture and then he'd walk off to the next student and she'd be so stuck in the posture. She'd be like, Psst. to Todd, She'd be like, can you push me over? He'd have to get up and like push her over just so she could like get out of the posture. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, can you push me over? To push me over. So, and so there was this, and this was right when Todd first came to India. So he was very much a beginner at that point. So this advanced student was like trying to get the beginner eight. Hey, push me over so I can like so that's the that's the my thought process right is the advanced student is the one that's ego's been shattered so they know they know nothing you know and if and if anybody tells you they have all the answers they don't we're all I mean even Patanjali doesn't doesn't claim to have all the answers we're just we're just studying ourselves and yes and I said this too there are a lot of people in the yoga world that are strictly yoga asana as far as exercise like they and I was that way for a very long time of course in the ashtanga lineage when you're in the the heat of that ashtanga practice all your body can handle is ashtanga asana because it's so damn exhausting people lose a lot of weight it's just, it's just a lot there's a lot of calories being burned and so in reality energy wise you really can't go off and do like a kickboxing class after it can you Emmy? <laughs> 
after no you can't so um so I'll this another funny story I'll I'll tell you guys after this so but what I've done with the challenge specifically because I I have dabbled in other modalities I love bar a lot because of the activation of the bundas is I've taken the philosophy because this philosophy can't you can any way you you use your body whether that's through yoga or running or tennis or dance or whatever it is you can take this philosophy and you can incorporate it into that movement it's changing the perspective of the movement so if you're like a dancer you're not looking for to perform you're going to actually feel what these shapes your body is making because essentially what we're doing in yoga is we're making shapes with our body. So whatever shapes your body is making, what is being triggered by that? Now on the course, we're going to get into more detail because what we're actually doing is sacred geometry, which we're going to get into in the course when we look at the count, uh, the sum is DTE being the point zero position and then drawing out of the graph of how your body is actually moving and the graphs you're drawing because there's a little bit more to it than that with uh, traditional yoga. But that is why in this the 30 day challenge, I incorporated kickboxing, I incorporated bar, I incorporated dance, because I want you guys to see that these things can be this, this, this theory, it's, it's always 99% practice. Anyway, it can be incorporated. So if you are on the spiritual journey, I would say for every person out there, get yourself a copy of the yoga sutras. You will read, I read, I read one or two a day. Yeah. I read one or two a day. I do one of the lessons every day in uh, A Course in Miracles, and I read a session from Ra. Yes. It, it takes like 15 minutes. Yeah. Let's, I mean, one of the most powerful sutras is the first sutra of the first pada, which mm -hmm. is now the exposition of yoga is being made. Are now the now yoga now yoga begins. Now the study of yoga begins. So when you first read that, you think, okay, it's first sutra. We're starting now. But let's think about this. What is Patanjali really saying here? In this very first sutra, if there is, if tomorrow, if the past is gone and tomorrow never comes, what happens every day you step on your yoga mat? You're present. Now, now the study of yoga begins. That's the most important word there. At home, now, now, now the study of yoga begins. So whether it's your first day stepping on the yoga mat or you've been doing this for 20 years. I've been doing this for 16 years. Every morning I step on my yoga mat. Now the study of yoga begins. Because the practice I did yesterday doesn't exist anymore. The practice I did this morning doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. It's done. It's not coming back. It's done. It's a moment in time. Tomorrow morning I step on my yoga mat. Now the study of yoga begins again. It's never ending. And that, that is that people often neglect that first, that very first sutra, the very first sutra right there. We are going to go through the San Sanskrit of it in the course as well. But for this video, I'll just say the English. That is the most, one of the most important, the first two sutras are two of the most important sutras. Now, I like how he says in the second one, if people can get this and they don't need to go, they don't need to read any further. <laughs> yeah. No, well, that's, I, the second one is Yoga Chitta Vritti Narodaha. I say that all the time. It's the second sutra. Yoga Chitta Vritti Narodaha. What does that mean? Okay. Well, it's so funny because the Gnostic text, they call God the no thing. Why do they call God the no thing? Because God, the ultimate source, God, not the archons and the demigods and the lucifers, but the ultimate God, is silent it's a silent consciousness that runs through everything it's that that's that movement between your hands it's the no thing so yoga chitta vritti narodaha narodaha is no thing it's nothing yoga chitta means the brain the mind stuff vritti are the thoughts so every thought you think through the chitta through the brain comes out of you are typically down into you where you're the, the the brain and the body are the same thing guys that's the one thing you learn through through yoga too your brain your body is the mind field these two things are work together right and so yoga what is yoga a lot of people mistranslate that they say it's silencing the mind it's not silencing the mind to silence something means it's not it's just quiet it's lurking still it's the no thing it's finding the nothingness. It's removing the thought. Now that's the unsolvable riddle, as my teacher David Gurry would say, the, unatta the unattainable unicorn. 
because we will always be working on that. And what we learn to do in our practice is to observe our thoughts and see them just as thoughts. So that's where the Narodaha really comes in. When we realize our thoughts aren't real. They're not real. They're just reactions to some sort of action. And we've created the drama around it. Our, th our thoughts are like the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. It's like the Bravo channel. The thoughts are creating a telenovela. But it's not real. And so when we realize that we'll still continue to have them. But then they, and, he, and Sri Swamimi Siddhi Dhananda talks about that. He says once, in, in one of the, one of the, I can't remember which sutra it is, but in his commentary, he says, once you realize that none of this shit's real, you really start to enjoy life. Mm -hmm. You don't take it so seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Probably my favorite, I say it all the time in, in A Course in Miracles, it says, nothing real can be threatened. And nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. And how you can tell if something is real or not is if it stands alone and doesn't need anything else. Light stands alone. Darkness is the absence of light. So darkness depends on light, but light doesn't depend on darkness. So darkness is not real. Love is real. It stands alone. Evil is the absence of love. Evil depends on an absence of love to exist. Evil is not real. Yeah. Let's look at that with the body and the soul. Can the body stand alone without the soul? Nope. Can the soul stand alone without the body? Yes. So is the body real? It's just a really fun Christmas tree decoration. <laughs> <laughs> it's just really fun one. you know i was i wasn't with you and stephanie or someone i was laughing about this with and I, it gets so i mean your soul is so powerful like literally one of the karmas we have is inherited karma and so you part of you picking your parents yes we all picked our parents was you pick them for their weaknesses because you wanted to learn from that experience that they've had that got passed to you Right. So when the sperm, whatever energy was being held, in that sperm and whatever energy was being held, in that that egg met, that then became your karma. And you pick that for a reason. That's your power. That's your power move. Plot twist. You sat down as the all knowing being your soul is. And you said, all right, that person and that person, there's something they have that I want to learn from. And so I'm going to I'm going to jump in through them and, and take some of that karma that's how powerful you are. But I was laughing with someone. I was like, but you look at, so that means that you designed everything about yourself. You designed your eye color from their DNA. You know, everything your parents had, the plethora of ancestors, you picked everything for whatever reason you needed to learn. For whatever reason, my soul decided to have blue eyes in this life. Maybe I know with the RH negative blood, the back of my eyes shaped differently. Maybe there was an experience. My soul wanted to learn from that. So it picked two people. Both my parents have blue eyes. So we can have that, right? So I was saying to someone, I was like, you look at some people in this world, though, and you go, that's what you went with. <laughs> that knows, like, <laughs> out of all, all of them. So, you know, and that's what he's saying, though. When you start to realize that you can enjoy life, you can laugh at life. My teachers in India say the highest form of spirituality is a sense of humor, mm. is being able to laugh at yourself, being able to laugh at the ridiculousness of life. And maybe that's a challenge. Maybe I should have added that to the challenge. Maybe in, in everything we've been going through these past couple of years, can we find the humor in it? Can we find the humor in where we've been and what we've been through? You know, and it's, 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 I know we can because I see the memes on Instagram. Mm -hmm. What was, I saw a big, a big bird meme and big bird was walking down the street and this little kid came up to the meme and was, I think it was Tamar that sent it to me and was like, Big Bird, where are you off to today? And Big Bird said, I'm going to Arizona to teach them how to count. You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> so as awful as the 
this whole thing is, there's still a humor there. There's still a sense of humor. I know God has a sense of humor. I know that. You know, and, and, and what is humor? Well, we talk about with demonic entities. Humor is the biggest weapon there is. They don't know how to laugh. In a very literal sense, look at like the uh, the bad guys will say, the DS, the D state, if you guys know what I'm saying, in all countries. And then look at like the good ones. These, they don't know how to laugh. They fake laugh. You know, like like if you look at like the woke stand-up comedians, nothing's funny anymore because they don't know how to laugh because laugh and uh, laughter and, and 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 silliness and all that kind of, that's the highest state of god it's a what's a high you can't if you're have you ever i know i know i just kind of a rhetorical question because i know ever been in that with a friend where you're laughing so hard at something you can't breathe your vibration what your stomach is crunch, crunching up that shows you how vibration how highly vibratory that that action is and you feel it in your body you're crying because you're laughing so hard that's the highest state of god mm -hmm. and we only find what what do we say we can only find that through the polarity of the, of, of having the pain of having bouts where we are suffering because I know I've been addicted to my pain before. I'll probably a bit be addicted again at some point, you know, but then being able to move to the opposite end of that and laugh at it. Mm -hmm. Cause that's how little that power, that's where your power less and that be living in that suffering is powerless. But when you see the suffering for nothing more than something that doesn't exist, it becomes powerful because you can laugh at that. Does that make them? I'm making sense with that because it's mm -hmm. not. I'll tell you guys a funny story. I said I would another Patabi Joy story. So back in the 90s, when Yoga Journal came out, I won't say the teacher's name. There was a teacher, a yoga teacher in America who was on the cover of Yoga Journal. And Patabi Joyce had had his headbutts with Yoga Journal before. He wrote a skating letter, letter to them at one point about, um, in America, we were calling it power yoga. And he was like, how fucking dare you? Power is God. Yoga is just the tool. You know, just it's a beautiful letter. It's scathing. Anyway, so this guy, this famous American yoga teacher from the 90s who was on the cover of Yoga Journal, came to India to practice with Patabi Joyce. And he brought the magazine with him on the cover on it to show Patabi Joyce like he was proud of himself. And Patabi Joyce was furious and so he worked that guy so hard every practice todd said guruji was here in this little house in lakshmi Puram. this guy this teacher's house was right next door he would get his ass handed to him so hard in practice that he would have to hire a rickshaw driver <laughs> to be waiting to pick him up to drive him next door. Todd was like, the guy didn't even have to turn his gas on. He just pushed his foot like a Flintstones car. And like, cause he was so beaten up. Cause Guruji was like, this ego has got to go. Basically, how dare you bring a magazine with you on the cover? I'm thinking you're going to impress me a guru. You got to break your ego, humble yourself. And he humbled him, you know? So I always, I can just imagine. Cause I, I know I've had those days of like hobbling out of the shala, like, <laughs> <laughs> my body hurts so bad what's happening so it is so funny because Sharat's mother Sarah Swati she's like in her 80s and she still teaches she still teaches at the Shala too she has her, her classes as well or that she teaches one of the only female teachers in India and one of my friends practices with her and he said he knew that she was his teacher because at four o'clock in the morning, he was waiting outside to go in and he could see her through the window and she was eating a Snickers, Snickers bar. And he was like, that's my teacher. <laughs> and then she also does Zumba competitions. And I love it because, and I was thinking as I'm hobbling out of the shala, like I bet they don't get this much pain in Zumba. You know, here's <laughs> Sarah's watching doing her like Indian Zumba, Zumba competitions at 80 years old, but she teaches Mysore all the time. And you know, it's, it's just, our bodies are powerful things, guys. And, um, Amy, is there any last parting words that you want to tell people about the Reiki side of this course for that one spot we have left or for the people that are going to be joining us already on Sunday? Oh, man. Well, I'm going to I'm writing something up just a, uh, a few 
um, facts and tidbits about Reiki, what it is and what it is not. Um, I'm going to get that over to Bryce um, today or tomorrow to put in the manual. Um, but basically, in a nutshell, Reiki is just um, spiritually guided life force. It can do no harm. Um, it is intelligent. It, it knows where to go. Uh, the you know the the practitioner that you work with doesn't even need to know really what's wrong with you. The Reiki will address it. Um, it's helpful to know ahead of time what you would like to work on because different energies work with different things. Um, so your practitioner, you know, can hold space for you and um, send different energies that work with different things. But ultimately, um, Reiki is is God. It is consciousness. It knows everything about you. It knows things about you that you don't know. It knows where to go and what to do. And it's very relaxing. And it works with the part of your nervous system that is responsible for rest, digest, and repair, the parasympathetic nervous system. When that part of your nervous system is activated, healing happens. Um, so yeah, that's about it in a nutshell. When you said that, I was going to ask you before we even started filming, and I mean, I'll just put you on the spot and ask you here on camera. I am thinking about doing a big episode on, we talk, you were talking about digestive and the parasympathetic nervous system. I think about doing an actual episode just on the gut. Would you yeah. 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 When I, when I first created this YouTube, my YouTube channel, one of the topics that I wanted to do a series on was gut health. And I've been so busy. I haven't gotten to it yet. Let's I haven't do gotten it. to it yet. Cause that was, I, I, I filmed myself the Mola Bunda, the Udiana Bunda. That's all gut health too. And I feel myself doing that. I'm going to continue to work with you guys on that because that's also that that also covers the area of like the first three chakras, which are the most ignored. And so um, we want to look at the physical and the energetic combining themselves. And so, um, so yeah, and that's why part of the challenge, guys, I'm having you to stop eating after 7 p.m. I said this on one of the videos this week. So that if you stop eating at 7 p.m. and you don't snack at night, you're giving yourself at least 12 hours between meals and it's giving your digestive system a, a, a chance to rest and so if you snack at night what's happening is all the blood in your body is going to your digestive system to break that food down but if you stop snacking and you give your your digestive system a, a chance to rest the blood's then going to be able to disperse around the body and heal other parts of the body as well and so sometimes that's why we have like food hangovers that's why if we snack at night we don't wake up the best in the morning but if you stop snacking at a certain time, you, you're giving your body that regeneration. The nervous system can regenerate all this stuff. So, and it does come back to allowing because the gut is also kind of the second brain, um, all that kind of stuff. And 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 working with Uriana and Malabunda, which we will go deeper into in the course as well. Um, that's pulling that energy up in through the organs. So, um, I'll also let's let's work on a video as well to do just in general about gut health and, and all that kind of, and that's why drinking water is important too it flushes the cola it flushes all this stuff out so anyway guys I will, I will say just one more thing I will say the one activity that I did for my gut health that helped the most was I went I and I still do this I go by locally grown if I can find it if not Make sure it's organic, locally grown if possible, vegetables, any kind, cabbage, carrots, broccoli, beets, anything, anything. Watch some YouTube videos on how to ferment vegetables. You can ferment them on your counter. Yeah, it takes like three yeah. weeks. Yeah. Super easy. You don't need expensive equipment. You can buy expensive equipment, but you don't need it. You can just do it with... Um, Guys, you if you buy Alfredo sauce or spaghetti sauce or salsa or whatever, save the jars. Yeah. You don't even need to buy mason jars. And super easy to ferment vegetables and eat a couple tablespoons of those every day. I'm telling you what, you are going to be absolutely amazed at the clarity of your thinking, um, at the reduction of anxiety and depression. Like when you have a healthy gut bacteria, your whole life will change. Oh, I yeah. promise you. It's amazing. 
Amazing. Yeah. And we, we actually ferment here too from time to time as well. We, we've been doing that as well. We are lucky though, because in a city we have did a cap farmer's market. We have a bunch, we have access, but in small towns, you should also have access to like a farmer to f- locally grown stuff as well. If so, not though, your, your local grocery store will have organic vegetables. Yeah. They yeah. should. So, so we'll, we'll, let's, let's plan on doing that a little bit later and me doing a big gut one because that is so important. And I, 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 kind of why I snuck that into the challenge because I wanted people to start to kind of experience wake you know it's it seems seems crazy but if you give your digestive system like 12 hours of rest you usually wake up with more energy because the organs have prepared themselves because they weren't the blood wasn't all having to be used in your digestive tract so um so yeah so it's it's all this stuff is in your right I I've struggled because I'm bought I have struggled with constipation in the past um I thought it was normal that you didn't go to the, the, I just thought everybody went to the bathroom like once a week and that was it. And it wasn't until I got, really, I, I thought that was, that like, so oh bad. my gosh. I in Los Angeles, my boyfriend at the time who I lived with was the first person that clued me in that wasn't normal. Cause he can and I'm very private about this stuff, but he came out of the living room one day and he was like, I think I need to take you to the hospital. And I was like, why? He was like, when was the last time you went to the bathroom? <laughs> I was like, I don't want to talk about this with you. And he's like, no, this is concerning. He was like, I was like, listen, just because I'm not on the toilet for 45 minutes doesn't mean, but, but I was like, oh, you mean people do this every day? Like, I had no idea that people like did this every day. Um, so needless to say the house I grew up in, we had a separate bathroom. So I had no idea that my other family members were going, I just didn't know. Um, but as a Vata and I'm very thin, so I'm a very thin person. So, you know, I can tell when I haven't, been able to go to the bathroom but i then i got for me i got on a bunch of different herbs and then i learned in yoga if you struggle with that if you're super constipated the teacher won't let you practice because mm-hmm. you run the risk of bruising your internal organs and so and then when i when i got on these herbs and i started eating for my dosha and i was like oh this makes a huge difference <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh and if you're Vata like me and you just assumed that something somebody did once a week, no, you're supposed to do it like once a day, a couple times a day, maybe even that. So, um, so, but we can talk about that on the episode together. We can talk about all the different remedies. I've done colonics myself. Those are fun. Um, we can talk about all the different things you can do, which is a Kriya and yoga. Colonic would be a Kriya and yoga, uh, which we'll get into in a, in, a, in a later episode. So, all right, you guys, um, <laughs> One spot left, you guys. So I'm going to put the link down in the description box below. We are meeting this Sunday for our first class at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So make sure you know when that is for your time. And we'll go from there because I am going to do smaller groups throughout the week to work on the asana stuff that we can. I will be providing you guys with some links to some other stuff you can work on on your own. You're going to have a lot of homework the first week uh, dealing with the first pada of the sutras. And I'm really excited. I'm really, we got a great group of people. And so hopefully uh you know man in the mirror we got to change ourselves first before the world changes right so yes all right you guys we'll talk to you soon bye everybody bye.